Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the COVID Science Solutions and Success Stories. Um, COVID Science and Solutions continues. Uh, my name is Kevin Hedges. I'm an occupational hygienist with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. Um, and you'll see that there's a logo on the top right hand side there um, that I snuck in. Um, I'm also uh, the international president with Workplace Health of That Borders. I'm a volunteer uh, member of that organization. So if I can just, we just think about the current surge in COVID cases in Canada, it's really likely to climb throughout winter, um, particularly given the increased time spent and interactions indoors compounded by the difficulty in maintaining natural ventilation at low temperatures. Therefore, every workplace needs to consider and boost alternate controls, including the proper use of respiratory protection, which is the focus of this webinar. And this will be critical to protect all frontline workers in and out of healthcare. Um, and so we've been following um, the studies um, from OK. So scientific studies have shown properly fitted and worn N95 or better respirators provide greater protection than surgical masks. It is important that we understand the difference, the impact of making the wrong choice, and learn how judicious use is making a difference in COVID prevention around the world. Um, so I'm the, the first speaker, and I want to talk about international lessons from China and Australia. Um, I'm also uh, really glad that Alec Farquhar has agreed to join in and um, introduce um, uh, a recording of Maria Possumai that he gave at Lancaster House. So thank you for, for joining in, Alec. Um, and we've also got uh, Nicholas Smith, who I'll introduce before he presents. He'll be talking about elastomeric respirator effectiveness and use. And um, I'm also going to be talking about respiratory, respirator program considerations for non-healthcare workers and workplaces. So evaluating the need and implementation guidance for COVID-19. And I'm grateful for um, Dr. Margaret Sietzma from the University of Illinois, who's actually provided her slide deck um, and she said that I could uh, give it on her behalf. Um, um, she's she wasn't available for this presentation, and then we want to allow some time at the end for Q and A. So then on to um, the first part of the presentation. Uh, you can see that the numbers are climbing, and and on the left there, um, I've pulled from the uh, Ottawa Ontario COVID nineteen regional risk tool. And I've just plugged in um, um, Peel, to Toronto, and Ottawa, and just to look at the different numbers. But you can see, and this was actually uh, sourced the 9th of December, so a couple of days ago. You can see Toronto and Peel are, are in the, the high risk area now. And if you look at the right, so that's locally in Ontario, and then you look across Canada, the numbers are still rising, which is quite alarming. I just want to, each of us to take a minute and reflect on, on what's happening, um, or what's happened um, with a doctor from China um, actually being punished in a way for speaking out and he passed away not long after. Uh, and then there's been a lot of messaging around um, the form that the coronavirus is in. And I just want you to take a look at the caption on the right there. I'm not going to say too much, but just think about how this is this whole situation is 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 impacting you personally. Uh, recently, um, <clears throat> Dr. Teresa Tam acknowledged airborne transmission, which in my my, my uh, opinion was a breakthrough you know, that the Dr. Tam actually acknowledged um, airborne transmission, and that was on the 13th of October. There must be a better way. Um, 
the evidence is out there now um, that airborne transmission must be looked at. Uh, Teresa Tams um, acknowledged it. And we've been trying to sort of promote, um, you know, the precautionary principle and, and good practices both throughout the through the Occupation Health Clinics for Ontario Workers and also Workplace Health Without Borders. So I've just kind of cherry picked, you know, there's been more presentations than, than what's up here in front of you, but I've just cherry picked the, rel the relevant presentations. So when you do get to the look at the slide deck, you can s click on these um, hyperlinks and you can actually watch the YouTube video behind each of these presentations. And um, just uh, on behalf of Workplace Health Without Borders, on the 16th of December um, at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, we've got um, a, a, a really well-renowned um, speaker from the University of New South Wales, Professor Rainer McIntyre, um, who's going to be talking about uh, research, research on respiratory protection. And we're also fortunate to have Assistant Professor Susan Arnold from the University of Minnesota talk about the the mask making that an academic team um, has carried out. Um, and she's going to be talking about the, the, um, the team building behind that and talking about the mask as well. So um, that's free. Anybody's welcome to join in. And, you, you know, if anybody wants to become a, work, a member of Workplace Health Without Borders, it doesn't cost anything. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a great networking opportunity and there's lots of good information shared. Okay, so just looking at lessons from China, and um, I actually borrowed this information from Lawrence Sverchev. So he's um, the American Industrial Hygiene Association ambassador to China. Um, but you'll see that China, um, you know, last December, uh, the first infection clusters reported to, China, to CDC China. And then there was a, a massive deployment, you know, a, You've sort of followed the press deployment of uh, you know medical doctors from, from around China to Wuhan, aggressive public health measures, mass quarantine, rapid building of dedicated field hospitals, um, and then a, a massive amount of production of medical respirators rose to 30, 30 million per day. It's a seven times seven point eight times increase, um, and then February the eighteenth, daily new cases peaked in China. And then not long after that, daily recovery surpassed the number of new cases. So then mid-February, 99% of international cases were located in China. March 10, all temporary field hospitals closed. All returnees to China, 14-day quarantine by law. And then look at that, March 19, zero new local cases reported in the Hubei province, but 41 new imported cases. I just uh, put this picture up here. Um, this is just a nurse um, who's, you can see how her face has been affected from wearing respiratory protective equipment. What's really striking is that, you know, these um, nurses wore adult diapers so they could work for longer periods of time just to preserve supplies of personal protective equipment. Um, a very st stoic uh, culture and, um, you know, the, the out of 1,712 occupational diagnoses resulting in six um, medical doctors and one nurse death, as of February the 18th, uh, most confirmed cases were before the 5th. So they really um, reacted quite well. I'm sorry, somebody's trying to speak. Okay, just so the bottom line here is it indicates an extraordinarily high level of occupational health safety protections in healthcare. So we really do have a lot to learn from China's experience. I've just put these graphs up here. You can see that um, how China, really, they just had one wave, didn't they? Um, and they flattened the curve very quickly. The similar experience in Singapore, Korea, and Taiwan. Um, and um, you can see, I've just actually taken a, a snapshot from the latest um, uh, coronavirus world ometers site. You can see, still see the, the curves flatten. So the bottom left-hand corner there, you can see that, you know, the Western Pacific area went down quite quickly, 
but then other countries just kept rising. And this is just a caption um, from the secretary, the World, World Health Organization Secretary General. It's, he said the first pandemic in history that could be controlled, the great advantage we have is that the decisions we all make as governments, businesses, communities, families and individuals can influence the trajectory of this epidemic an uneven event in the global level. Now, I just want to reflect on this. And uh, Maria Possumai has done a fabulous job. You know, um, he was the lead investigator with SARS-1 and also um, the Lancaster House um, presentation. But he really emphasized that around the 20th of January, China introduced um, airborne precautions. So just taking a note that 20th of January, China introduced airborne precautions. Uh, okay, if we go to Australia, um, they've sort of gone through the second wave now. Uh, they've had very strict requirements, you know, uh, public gathering and lockdown. Um, but from an occupational hygienist perspective, um, what I want to share with you is um, the Australians have the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists, which is a well-recognised, um, well-recognised in Australia, has a high profile with Safe Work Australia. So they've actually got these, this information, this document freely available on, the, on their web. It's just a guide to buying P2 equivalent respirators. Um, the other thing that uh, the AOH have is they have a RespFit program so they have a, a, like a training and accreditation for doing fit testing for respirators um, as well. Um, also, they've got a newly formed expert panel to bring the latest evidence and clinical experience to prevent COVID transmission in healthcare settings. And um, a colleague of mine from Australia and friend, um, Kate Cole, with expertise in occupational hygiene, um, also, I have a colleague um, from Australia, Malcolm Sim, who's an occupational physician. Expert, he has expertise in occupational and in, in, in environmental medicine. So they've set up this um, this team, um, a task for us, if you like. Now, I just want to go back to um, Professor Raina McIntyre, who's presenting on the 16th. Um, and she actually uh, put this together, this, this sort of information together. And I think it, it's very kind of um, honest, really. Um, you know, he's got an expert putting his hand up in the air saying, uh, you know, coronavirus is not airborne. Um, and then somebody says, we found it in air samples on the COVID ward. And then the expert says, finding virus RNA in, in, in air samples does not mean it is infectious. We found viable virus in the air. Expert, the infectious dose may not be significant, but health workers are getting infected. They get, they got it on the bus. Um, now, I just want to quickly take you to this slide. And um, somebody I, res I, I, I respect who's been a, you know, a very um, strong advocate and very, um, she's, she's an academic. Um, she shared this with me. And, and I just want you to look at um, the, the term here, epistemic trespassing. Um, so epistemic tras trespass is judged matters outside their field of expertise. Trespassing is ubiquitous in this age of interdisciplinary research and recognizing this required us to be more intellectually modest. Um, so an occupational hygienist, um, uh, our science, our discipline is um, anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control. Our science is actually to protect um, workers from uh, physical, chemical, and biological hazards. Uh, this is something that uh, Mary Apossumai um, just shared with the network. Uh, so, you know, there's this kind of group in Germany um, of scientists that really saying that if you put these uh, six indoor air guidelines in place, then you could reduce the spread of COVID-19 by up to 90%. Uh, this is just a, a news article, and this is 
what it looks like, but it is a, a you know interdisciplinary group, and this is actually the um, the, the the document itself. And I've also uh, down the bottom there in in colouring. What's really remarkable here? Um, uh, N95 FFP2 masks are highly recommended because of their filtering efficiency for very small particles. You know, with a diameter uh, averaging about 0.5 micrometers. They should be, and they, they they go on to say they should be mandatory in many sectors instead of the simple hygiene masks and be improved as regards the breathing resistance and sealing. Um, so one of the authors of the document um, is also uh, uh, one of the people behind this, um, this frequently asked questions site that I provided a hyperlink. Um, it's probably one of the best hyperlinks I've seen to frequently asked questions, so I highly recommend you, you look at it. Um, so Mario uh, is going to be introduced by Alec. I've just provided a hyperlink to the full presentation from Lancaster House. Now I want to um, just throw over to um, to what's happening in Australia. Uh, Kate Cole, a colleague of mine who I talked more briefly about before, features on this um, on this video. And she's also about to be the uh, AIOH president in 2022. Since late June, more than 3,500 Victorian healthcare workers have been infected with the COVID-19 virus. More than 1,700 of those worked in aged care and nearly 1,100 in hospitals. If there's that level of staff being infected, it really is a big warning sign about the system and how well it's performing. Any infection or illness to our staff is a huge issue for us and uh, I'm, I'm personally very uh, upset about it and uh, concerned about it. I didn't need to be told that I had it because uh, I was full-blown, shortness of breath, um, shivers, shakes. Melbourne radiographer Bruno Trelia was working at Melbourne's Austin Hospital in July, x-raying sick patients when he tested positive. It was like no illness I've ever had. It was just unrelenting. I could not get a breath in. In August, the Victorian government tried to argue that most hospital workers were infected at home or in the community. The majority of healthcare workers are acquiring coronavirus outside of the workplace. Two weeks later, state health department research showed that almost seven out of ten infections most likely occurred at work. Arguably, that is one of the highest incidences of occupational illness and disease that we have seen in this country for more than a decade. So that tells us that we did something wrong and that we need to learn from it. Kate Cole sits on a Victorian task force set up following the state's second wave. Kate has worked in occupational safety in many potentially dangerous industries, including mining and construction. When I look at healthcare as a sector, I feel as though it's at least 15 to 20 years behind in terms of workplace health and safety. After initially being given a high protection respirator mask, Bruno Trelia says he was later told to use a surgical mask instead. At the time, we, we were following along the process of best practice. You put your faith in, in the people who are, uh, whose job it is to look at those things and to make those decisions. Do you regret the decision to having moved to surgical masks from N95 at the Austin? I think we were following the policies and procedures given to us by the Department of Health. So I definitely don't regret following procedures um, that the experts give us to do. Bruno Trellia spent a week in intensive care, where his greatest fear was having to be intubated. Mainly because I still have a, a young family. Uh, what are the implications if I don't survive? What are the implications if I survive but I'm, I'm drastically affected? The concern of healthcare workers is that cases like Bruno's may have been avoided had respirator masks properly fitted been available. There were also concerns early on about a shortage of high protection masks. 
certainly mask conservation or, or at least um, ensuring that we had enough mask supply was at the forefront. We wanted to make sure we never in a situation where we ran out of masks for ourselves or healthcare workers. 90% of our members had concerns about their safety. I've heard a lot of people who've wanted to speak up and who've been scared to, or people who have spoken up and haven't felt that their concerns were acted upon. One way to show you've listened to healthcare workers is to give them one of these. They need to be fit tested to ensure there are no leaks. And yet even now, fit testing is still not routinely done across Australian public hospitals. There wasn't any fit testing. Um, essentially, you, you had to use what was available to you um, there at the time. Um, and, and it was either that or nothing. Across the board N95s and across the board full face shields certainly would have made a difference to me and would have prevented my uh, in getting COVID. So how do you explain a thousand infections, more than a thousand infections in Victorian public hospitals? So we've learnt a lot about the, the uh, outbreaks in the, in the second wave. What happened and what we learn and we're still learning about is that the aged care patients were transferred into our hospital and uh, those patients when they were held together in groups uh, and where there was what we call aerosol generating behaviours which was wandering around and calling out and coughing and um, on people and so forth that that did increase the risk. One reason why there's been mixed messages about masks is that the infection control expert group that advises National Cabinet plays down airborne spread as an infection risk. I think the fact that we've now had three and a half thousand health workers infected, you know, 70, 80 percent of them likely to have acquired it in the workplace and we're still debating that, I find just very frustrating. They haven't had the benefit of a safe workplace like other Australian workers do in other high-risk industries. No matter what industry you work in in Australia, when you go to work, you should be protected. We recently strengthened our language in Victoria relating to the, the potential or the, the uh, evidence of airborne transmission, but I think it's fair to say there's controversy uh, and difficulty in the literature about how important it is, but we're taking a view that uh, to be cautious about it uh, and, and have a precautionary approach to it. Bruno's son caught COVID too, almost certainly from his father while he was asymptomatic. His son has done well. Bruno, though, is taking longer to recover. I fool myself into believing that I'm back to normal. The slow um, climb out um, and back to normality, that's the most um, frustrating part. The public hospital sector has had to um, really review and, and look at their practices and, and, to, and to step up. You really have to worry about the extent to which we can trust the system. And there's a real job to regain trust and make sure uh, everybody's working concertedly for care to be safer and of high quality. We need to learn from it and improve drastically to prepare ourselves in case there is a third wave because we can't just do the same thing and expect different results. A person that I want to introduce, um, Alec Farquhar. So Alec Farquhar has, um, he's headed up the Office of the Worker Advisor um, and he's also um, been a lead in uh, um, Asbestos Free Canada. Alec also sits on the board of um, Workplace Health Without Borders, which we're very grateful. Um, so, and uh, Alex actually going to introduce a, a video, um, a recording of um, um, Maria Possumine. Um, so over to you, Alec. Thank you so much, Kevin. <clears throat> Thank you, Ocal, for hosting this really important session. I'm so pleased on a Friday in the second wave of COVID to see over 100 people on this webinar and so many people who have made a great difference. I'm I'm one of many who've been working on the issue. When COVID-19 came along, I was uh, retired, working part-time, mostly as coordinator of Asbestos Free Canada. And I vividly remember the first day that uh, an announcement was made that I guess with my past experience, I thought, oh my God, this is the real thing, oh my God. And my second thought was, oh, but Ontario, 
we're ready. Um, I was director of the Occupational Health and Safety Branch at Ministry of Labor for three years uh, in the sort of last phase of the Campbell report and the first phase of implementing it. And a uh, number of changes were made at that time that I was very, very proud of the role I played in them and the role that my whole team played, especially people like Dr. Leon Genesov and many others, some, of, some are on this call, and the folks from the labor movement. Our big breakthroughs were the recognition of the precautionary principle. And the way that played out was the recognition that until we knew otherwise, we should use airborne precautions and therefore we should stockpile N95 respirators. So the stockpiles were something I thought of Oh, it's so great. We've got millions of N95s, we're ready. The second big change was the regulatory intervention, joint um, proactive inspections of long-term care homes by Ministry of Labor and Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care inspectors. And I thought to myself, oh my God, it's so great. We've been checking out in these places. We've been checking their pandemic preparedness plans. We're in shape here. Ontario, at least, we've got a leg up on this situation. And you can imagine my emotional reaction when I learned relatively soon thereafter that the stockpiles have been abandoned, the N95 respirators have been landfilled and not replaced, the proactive inspections had been abandoned, and here we were, unprepared in many, many ways. It's a tremendous credit to civil society in Ontario and Canada, how workplace parties stepped up, how the Health and Safety Association stepped up, OCAO stepped up, everybody did their best. But so much of what we were doing with was predictable, indeed had been predicted, preventable, indeed plans had been put in place to prevent it. And uh, a lot of the crisis that emerged from the lack of N95s directly are the result of whoever the hell made the decision <laughs> to landfill those N95s a few years ago. So into this situation, brave people step. And one of the bravest is Mario Posamai. Mario was lead investigator for Archie Campbell. Archie Campbell was dying of cancer as he wrote his report. So Mario was involved in so many different ways. And I'm very proud to have him as a friend. I got to work also with Sheila Basra, then provincial um, chief medical officer of health. She also died of cancer soon after the Campbell report came out. Mario has done, with the support of the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions, is the first deep review of what went right and what went wrong. And he's issued a groundbreaking report that's made, made a big impact. What you're gonna see is, a, I think, a shorter version of the Lancaster House presentation, which is almost half an hour long. And I would urge that after this session, take a chance to view the whole presentation. If you haven't read it, read Mario's report, just terrific. And uh, what I'll leave with you as, you as you sort of watch Mario is how can we make sure the hard, hard lessons we are learning right now. Lessons that have cost lives, lessons that have poisoned labor relations, lessons that have driven unions as their only recourse to take the government to court, to file grievances, that have led frontline workers to stage work refusals. All these were preventable. We cannot let this happen again. We must learn these lessons. So let's start with Mario. You're about to see something powerful, direct, very pragmatic and useful. So here you are. So just to recap, um, I was a senior advisor on the SARS Commission. Uh, it ran from 2003 to 2007. And uh, I, I was retained by the uh, Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions uh, to, to do a, an examination of, of how things have gone during the, uh, the first part of COVID-19 and to do so using the lens of the, of the SARS Commission and the SARS Commission uh, re recommendations. Um, so let, let's go to slide number two, please. So, you know, how do we measure our performance of uh, how well we did? And, you know, typically Canadians like to measure ourselves against the Americans, but uh, uh, these days, you know, the, uh, their, their pandemic response has been uh, tragic, uh, uh, unbelievable. So it's a very low bar. N next slide, please. I, I think, um, you know, a, a, a better comparison is with our SARS peers. That is uh, China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Um, uh, these four countries really were 
the hardest hit by SARS. So uh, the, these four countries had, uh, uh, you know, 94 percent of all cases, 94 uh, percent of all deaths, and uh, uh, you know, more than 90 percent of all cases involving healthcare workers. Uh, Canada had the largest outbreak outside of Asia, and also had one of the highest infection rates uh, in the world uh, with respect to healthcare workers. So, you know, all four countries, all four of us, uh, had the opportunity to learn from SARS and put those lessons into practice. And uh, unfortunately, um, China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan learned from SARS. Um, we did not learn well enough uh, the lessons of, of SARS. And, you know, I'll just give you one small example. Uh, Hong Kong, for example, uh, because of SARS, uh, requires all of their long-term care facilities uh, to have a three-month supply of N95 respirators. Uh, you know, that's a kind of detail that, that you see in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, and China, uh, as lessons learned from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from SARS. Uh, next slide, please. So when you look at, at, at how well we have done in comparison to, the, uh, to our SARS peers, as I call them, um, you know, we have not done well. And as, as, as John alluded, you know, the, the national figures show that uh, more than 21,000 Canadian healthcare workers have been infected with, with COVID-19. Uh, this is a, as of late, uh, late July. And uh, they comprise 19% uh, of about one in five COVID infections in Canada. Uh, that's nearly double the global rate as reported by the WHO. But when you compare that with uh, what happened in China it's, it's, uh, and the other, the other two uh, countries, it's stunning. Uh, uh, Chinese healthcare workers comprise 4.4% of COVID cases. And most of those were uh, before late January when they moved to airborne precautions. Um, uh, same in Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, very, very low infection rates. And, and you know, in the overall contain, containment picture, um, we've also done not well when compared to our peers. Um, you know, Canada, Canada has more COVID-19 cases than China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan combined. We have more COVID-related deaths than China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan combined, um, which, which I find a, 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 st a stunning figure. Next slide, please. And how, how do we explain this, 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 this difference between ourselves and, and our SARS peers? And, and I'm, I've used um, uh, Justice Campbell's uh, terminology here. Justice Campbell was head of the SARS Commission. Uh, he, he called it a constellation of problems. And I think there were really six issues that, that, that I'll talk about in more detail. Uh, failure to follow the precautionary principle. Failure to critically evaluate the WHO's guidance and its performance. Uh, failure to learn from China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan uh, as they went through COVID-19 before we did. Uh, failure to heed the pandemic preparedness lessons of SARS. You know, there's been an absence of uh, oversight and accountability over pandemic preparedness. Um, you know, our, our, uh, our N95 cupboard, our cupboard for, for PPE was, was bare at the start of, the, of COVID-19. Um, you know, how did that happen? You know, was everyone asleep at the switch? You know, that's, that's, these are issues that really need to be investigated. And finally, you know, th there's a real absence of worker safety expertise as an integral part of decision-making on worker safety guidance and strategy. You know, that was an issue identified in SARS. It's an issue that, uh, that, that persists. And it, here's, a, here's an example between Canada and, 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 and Hong Kong. Uh, in the early part of COVID-19, authorities in Hong Kong wanted to follow the WHO's guidance on public masking and avoid saying that public masking was important, even though public masking is more culturally uh, uh, permitted in, or uh, accepted rather in Hong Kong. But some of the senior people who, who had been involved in SARS um, objected to the government, the government of Hong Kong, and they changed their, their practice and uh, very early on said that public masking was an important tool in, in preventing COVID-19. Next slide, please. 
So this is uh, uh, Justice Archie Campbell, uh, my, the late Archie Campbell who died shortly after the uh, SARS report was, was completed, um, my great friend and mentor. And, and uh, you know, the, the core finding of the SARS commission was the precautionary principle. And that is, you know, where there is a, uh, where there is uncertainty on the science, you err on the side of safety. And, uh, you know, there are, as I will discuss, there are a lot of reasons why that came as an important lesson from, uh, from SARS. Next slide, please. What the precautionary principle means in practice is that when you face a new pathogen, you know, a, a disease like COVID-19 that we really are still trying to figure out, um, you err on the set of caution. You protect healthcare workers at the highest level uh, and then you, you only scale down that protection when you're certain that it's safe to do so. And the precautionary principle is not just about uh, healthcare workers. It also extends to things like um, a, a other con uh, containment measures like um, border closings and public maskings. And also being open to the fact that a new pathogen is new and unpredictable and can act in ways that we've never seen before. Like, for example, the high level of uh, asymptomatic transmission among, uh, uh, um, uh, among uh, COVID-19 uh, cases. N next slide, please. One of the things that, that has left me gobsmacked is that during COVID-19, we're having the same debate that we had during SARS about whether we should protect our healthcare workers uh, with N95 or higher or, or, or equivalents, or whether surgical masks are, um, are, are, are sufficient. Um, you know, what, what occurred during, during SARS is that the best evidence that SARS was spread uh, through, through aerosols didn't come till after the outbreak was over. And, and Justice Campbell uh, was, uh, uh, observed that, uh, you know, what those studies showed is that uh, they, they validated uh, the leadership of, of, of the SARS response in Ontario that ended up uh, requiring N95 respirators, though so that was very problematic. Uh, but that uh, in hindsight, uh, it, was, it, it was a good thing that we went for a precautionary approach. Now, fast forward to COVID-19, we're in a very different situation. And as, 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 as John knows better than, than anyone, um, the, the, the evidence of, of potential aerosol transmission now is, is, is significant and far, far more than we had during SARS. And, um, and so in a precautionary approach, um, you know, the, the, the evidence is, is, is overwhelming, um, uh, uh, not demonstrating a certainty that, that, that uh, COVID-19 is spread through aerosols, but, but uh, certainly supporting um, uh, decisions to protect healthcare workers at the highest levels, as opposed to waiting and waiting and waiting until there's this uh, overwhelming certainty. So, um, Alec, and thanks, Maria. Um, now, I, the next person that I want to um, present is uh, Nicholas Smith. So, uh, Nicholas Smith. Um, is s someone that's been advocating for healthcare workers to be able to use elastomeric respirators since the start of the pa pandemic. Um, so Nicholas has been active um, lobbying the Ontario and Canadian government to have approved and recommended elastomeric respirators as a safe N95 alternative. Um, his, his influence has helped get the province to buy I'm sorry, get the, got a, helps Ontario buy 100,000 elastomeric respirators for healthcare workers and get another 100,000 respirators donated to hospitals around the world through the help of the mining industry. Nicholas has collaborated with politicians, unions, journalists, organisations and experts around the world to help increase the public's understanding of elastomeric respirators and how they can be used to solve a lot of different problems called, caused by the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So really, um, Nicholas's uh, wealth of information 
he's gathered a lot of um, you know resources on elastomerics and he's just been a stalwart um, he's been so passionate in this area um, with the NDP trying to lobby the government to make these respirators um, elastomeric respirators available so I'd really like everyone to welcome Nicholas Smith My name is Nicholas Smith I'm here to present information on elastomeric respirator use their effectiveness and use I have been an advocate of one kind or of another since I was a young child. In March, I reached out to MPs and MPPs, and I was able to get the provincial and federal government to look into using elastomeric respirators for healthcare workers. And then in April, I reached out to the mining industry, and I was able to get them to donate hundreds of thousands of elastomeric respirators to hospitals in Canada, the US, Mexico, Peru, Chile, Argentina, and Australia. Besides teaming up with politicians, I've been able to team up with people like Mythbusters TV host Brian Loudon to help raise awareness of these respirators around the world. I was able to get several news organizations to publish articles on elastomeric respirators to increase awareness. I've worked with unions to help increase their understanding of elastomeric respirators and how they could keep healthcare workers safe from infection. And I did a presentation for Ontario MPPs to show them how these respirators could be used in non-healthcare settings to minimize the economic impact the virus has across a broad range of industries. In June, I was also able to get Doug Ford's office to buy 100,000 elastomeric respirators for healthcare workers but I am now fighting with the government to make sure these respirators actually get distributed because they were actually stored instead of handed out. I've also had the pleasure to collaborate with experts such as Kevin Hedges to increase my understanding of these respirators and how they could best be used. So what are elastomeric respirators? Well, they're typically made of synthetic or rubber material. They can be repeatedly used and disinfected. They tend to fit and seal better to an individual's face compared to N95. And like N95s, workers need to be properly fit tested and trained on how to use them. They may also require medical evaluation before they are used. Hierarchy of controls for COVID-19. Uh, PPE is the last line of defense and elimination of the hazard is the first line. The hazard for healthcare workers when it comes to COVID could be, reducing, could be reduced by eliminating the amount of infections in the community. And that could be done by effectively using N95s and elastomeric respirators in places where outbreaks occur, such as food plants and factories, so that less people would become infected and need to be hospitalized, putting healthcare workers at risk of infection. Engineering controls such as improving ventilation can also help reduce the risk of infection. And administrative controls such as staggering breaks, meals, and start times can help reduce the likelihood of exposure and the transmission among employees. Since healthcare workers cannot eliminate the risk completely with the other lines of defense, PPE can be used to keep them safe when all else fails. While N95s are the minimum acceptable level of protection for airborne transmission of the virus, elastomeric respirators can provide equal or greater protection. So this picture gives you a quick glance at a N95 on the left and then a face respir elastomeric respirator and what a full face elastomeric respirator would look like. N95s are disposable, but both types of elastomeric respirators are made to be reused and typically use filters that can be changed. There are several types of filters available for elastomeric respirators. The letter indicates whether the filter is not resistant to oil, which is N, somewhat resistant to oil R, or oil proof P. The numbers indicate the minimum filter efficiency. People do not realize that N95s and elastomeric respirators both started being used in the mid 90s to protect healthcare workers from infection from drug resistant tuberculosis. And elastomeric res respirators were first used at the Texas Center for Infectious Diseases in 1996, and they were used during SARS and H1N1. They have been approved and recommended for healthcare workers to use against COVID-19 since April. So health agencies in the US like the CDC, FDA, FEMA, OSHA, and Health and Human Services have been recommending healthcare workers use elastomeric respirators as a safe N95 alternative since early April. Yet it wasn't until May that Ontario Health started recommending Health Canada the Health Canada approval process was stalled. So I reached out to them in June and I was able to get them to update their guidelines online within a few days to start recommending elastomeric respirators as well. Since these recommendations are not well known, distributed or shared with news organizations, they continue to be overlooked and misunderstood. While N95s were made to be used for only a few hours, most elastomeric respirators are made to be used for years. The advantage to using N95s is that they're common, well-known, disposable, while the disadvantage is that they're in short supply, so they are being reused, which increases the risk of infection and do not protect as well as elastomeric respirators. The elastomeric respirator can be safely reused, they are readily available, and they can be safely used in more work environments. In order to use N95s or elastomeric respirators, employees need to be fit tested to determine their size, and there's a much higher fit test success rate with elastomeric respirators. 
So when it comes to elastomeric respirators, a lot of people can benefit from using them. Not only can healthcare workers benefit from using these respirators, but any employee who could be exposed at work would benefit as well. Any work site where outbreaks occur, such as food plants or factories, can greatly benefit from using these respirators to protect their employees, and this would significantly cut down transmission in the workplace and prevent a lot of the outbreaks and the community spread that tend to follow those outbreaks. Benefits from using elastomeric respirators for employers, besides reducing the chances of infection, include employees using less sick days, supporting the use of PPE and advertising to get more customers into their businesses, increased productivity since employees would have less worries about being infected and can focus more on their work, and would also help businesses remain open with less chances of needing to shut down operations to deal with the spread of the virus. Dairy benefits include limiting economic losses due to outbreaks, reducing the need for citywide shutdowns, and it would slow down hospitalizations and slow the spread at schools since less parents would be infecting their children. There are a few studies on elastomeric respirators in healthcare settings. The American College of Surgeons study showed a 90% in cost savings by switching from N95s to elastomeric respirators. In all 2,000 healthcare workers that used elastomeric respirators for the trial did not want to return to using N95s because they were so well liked. The second study is a detailed study on elastomeric respirators and looks into their history of use in healthcare, how to use, clean, and maintain the respirator, and it also makes recommendations for routine and surge use. The article on elastomeric respirators for all healthcare workers is a great article that details the benefits of widespread use of elastomeric respirators by healthcare workers. Here are some great news articles on elastomeric respirators. The first article is from former ADC director Tom Frieden, who explained in February how an N95 shortage would be inevitable and that elastomeric respirators would be the solution to prevent that looming shortage. The USA Today article is from early April and talks about the 2018 CDC recommendations to stockpile elastomeric respirators the national PPE stockpile and how the failure to listen to those recommendations hurt healthcare workers in the pandemic response. The third article is a great New York Times article that talks about healthcare workers using elastomeric respirators, but that they continue to be overlooked despite all the top health agencies recommending them as a safe N95 alternative. The Radio Canada article is the only Canadian news article that mentions the Health Canada approval process for elastomeric respirators. And the New York Daily News article describes how New York City stopped buying N95s altogether and are only buying elastomeric respirators for their first responders. The Sudbury Star article that came out a couple weeks ago is the only news article in Canada that confirms the approval and recommendation by Ontario Health to use elastomeric respirators. And the only article that explains Ontario Health recommends to recover the exhalation valve with a cloth, procedural, or surgical mask to offer source control if needed. Which leads me to my next slide misinformation surrounding elastomeric or surrounding exhalation valves. The biggest misconception around elastomeric respirators is that they cannot be used in a healthcare setting since they have an exhalation valve. Besides a huge lack of communication from government and health agencies surrounding their recommendations to use elastomeric respirators, they have failed to make sure the public knows how to safely cover the exhalation valve to offer source control. The failure to inform the public that the exhalation valves could be covered is one of the biggest oversights of the health agencies during the pandemic. Health Canada, Ontario Health, and politicians have been responsible for spreading misinformation about elastomeric respirators being too dangerous to use due to the valve issue, and none of these agencies or politicians have made any attempt to clear up the misinformation or apologize for their mistakes, so this information continues to be picked up and cited as fact by news organizations such as CBC and CTV News. NIOSH is currently looking at approving several elastomeric respirators with an exhalation valve, and this one is the first one that they approved, which was approved about three weeks ago. Canada is also looking at, into approving several elastomeric respirators without an exhalation valve, and this is the first one to be approved by Health Canada. Another misconception is that elastomeric respirators cannot be used because there are not enough available. There are not only enough elastomeric respirators available for every healthcare worker in Canada, there are also enough to protect all our first responders and to provide to businesses that could experience outbreaks. Several manufacturers have confirmed that they each have enough elastomeric respirators to provide one to every healthcare worker in Canada. Each elastomeric respirator used can prevent the need to use thousands of N95s, and by putting elastomeric respirators into widespread use, the N95 shortage would no longer be a serious problem in Canada. And Canadian fact manufacturers like Trevor RX can produce 50,000 of these respirators per day, and Dorma can produce 1 million per month. Another misconception that often prevents people from considering elastomeric respirators is that they think the cost is too high compared to an N95. Healthcare workers would typically need to use 7 to 10 N95s per shift to follow recommendations on safe use, 
yet they now typically reuse the same N95 for the entire shift or for days to weeks at a time. If only one N95 is used per shift, the cost can quickly add up. By switching to reusable respirators over disposable ones, the cost savings will keep adding up the longer they are used. The American College of Surgeons study showed a 90% cost reductions by switching from N95s to elastomeric respirators. Buying in bulk would also significantly reduce costs. This is something uh, to help organizations figure out potential cost saving. The screen shows what is used to make calculations and shows an example how much money can be saved by switching to elastomeric respirators. The link at the bottom of the slide is where you can find that uh, calculator online. So another major misconception is that elastomeric respirators cannot be used because they are hard to communicate in. Like N95s, some elastomeric respirators can muffle sounds. To help improve communication, some manufacturers have created speech diaphragms and some have built better acoustics into the, the design of the respirator to offer better communication abilities than N95s or traditional elastomeric respirators. This is an example of an elastomeric respirator with a speech diaphragm. At the bottom right, you see uh, where the exhalation valve and the speech diaphragm is. Our, a lot of people are just learning about elastomeric respirators in healthcare settings. While Ontario Health started recommending healthcare workers use elastomeric respirators in May, experts in Canada and the US have been recommending their use for decades, and they have been safely used since 1996. Since a major lack of communication and awareness around the use of elastomeric respirators, most people do not realize they are recommended by the top health agencies in both Canada and the US. Here are just a few Canadian articles from years past on elastomeric respirators in healthcare settings. Here are just a few, due to the PPE shortage, uh, new elastomeric respirator manufacturers have entered the market. In Canada, Demer, Dorma and Trevor RX have both stepped in to help. In the US, Mask Force, Eni, and United Safety Technology have started manufacturing elastomeric respirators as well to help with the supply shortage. And here is some additional manufacturers, and I included a link at the bottom of the slide for anyone that is looking to look, find NIOSH-approved elastomeric respirators. An important aspect to elastomeric respirator use is to know how to safely disinfect them. Since every elastomeric respirator is different, it is best to speak with a manufacturer to determine what can be used to disinfect the respirator. I'll just quickly go through the next slides so you can see the recommended recommendations and links to those recommendations are at the bottom of each slide. So these are the Ontario Health recommendations, including daily cleaning. These are the Ontario Health recommendations for interim wipe cleaning. Health Canada, the CDC both recommend to use OSHA's respiratory guidelines to how to disinfect them. So these are the OSHA recommendations. Then IRRST also recommends uh, different ways to disinfect them as well. So here are more resources on disinfection you can look into. And the first link also includes a video on how to don and doff, which is how to put the respirator on and take it off, as well as how to disinfect the respirators. There will be a 30 minute question and answer session after everyone has presented. So I'll answer questions shortly. Anybody who'd like to reach me can reach me by email, Twitter, and LinkedIn if you have further questions, or if you'd like additional resources, I can always email you or send you additional resources. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, now, just I doubt very much we're going to have 30 minutes for questions. Um, but, you know, we, we may have some time for questions. Um, I, I'm going to now present um, uh, my presentation, the last presentation, um, on behalf of Margaret uh, Sitsima from University of Illinois. Um, so Margaret actually presented through the, um, the International Society for Respiratory Protection um, uh, through their webinar series. And I've actually provided a hyperlink to her original presentation here and also the whole webinar here as well. Um, so the ISRP is a, it's an international organization and there's some great resources there. Um, but, you know, before I present, Really, we're in Canada, so our national standard of Canada is this standard here. So I highly recommend everyone to look at it. And I see that the, um, the Canadian Standards Association um, actually have a read-only um, uh, access to this standard as well. So you, it looks like you don't even have to buy it. You can read it online there. Um, you just need to register, but you can read it online. That's it. So Margaret's um, to, to, to presentation. 
Um, it's from the US, but you'll find that a lot of the um, requirements here are very similar to the Canadian standard. Uh, Margaret actually talks about the hierarchy of control. Um, you obviously can't substitute coronavirus, that's why it's not there. But really, you know, respiratory protective program is put in place uh, along with all these other controls as well. Um, so I guess, do you need a respiratory protection program? So do workers work indoors? Do workers work in close proximity to other people less than six feet uh, for greater than 15 minutes and other controls are not available? It's quite simple really, isn't it? How do you know whether you need to put a respiratory protective program in place if that criteria um, is met? So the OSHA requirements, so there I won't go through them. Like I said, they're very similar to the uh, the Canadian standard, but you know, fit testing um, is obviously important. And also selection is important as well. So if you look at the, with the Canadian standard, they actually have a very good section on there on bioaerosols. And they also uh, talk about using a controlled banning approach. So I highly recommend you to look at that controlled banning selection criteria um, for, you know, for respirators, especially for healthcare workers. And just, there was a comment in the chat box about powered air purifying respirators. Um, I don't know if anybody has uh, watched Grey's Anatomy lately. It's sort of like a COVID series of Grey's Anatomy. But you see a lot of people that actually in that show in PAPRs. You need to have a written program. It's really important that there's a program administrator assigned. So I'm just thinking about hospitals, for example, um, although this is for non-healthcare workers, but even for non-healthcare workers and hospitals, you really need a program administrator. And uh, you know, ideally the administrator could be an occupational hygienist. Uh, it's uh, what needs to be included in the program. Um, and this is a risk assessment respirator selector. Um, so employees exposed to COVID-19 at work should use at a minimum a respirator with an N95 filter. They're uh, capable of filtering out the very small particles, um, at least 95% at 0.3 microns. And it's likely they filter out 95% particles in other ranges. Uh, and because um, the coronavirus uh, is airborne, um, this is imperative. Uh, really make sure that it's got the right kind of certification, you know, and having a respirator um, approved by Health Canada doesn't mean that it's got NIOSH certification. So it really should, you know, it really should have NIOSH certification. That's imperative. And you can look at the uh, the respirator casing here to, for these kind of details. Um, just the difference between the elastomeric and the, and the N95. And as Nicholas said, it has an exhalation valve, the elastomeric respirator. Um, there was also a full face. So the protection factor, which includes the filtration efficiency and also the face fit um, for a full face is, is even greater again. And obviously the PAPR, offers the best protection there. Um, there are issues with exhalation valves, and I did put in the chat uh, box that you can put a surgical mask over the top of the exhalation valve. And I see in the, one of the uh, latest NIOSH report, they're actually talking about sealing off the exhalation valve from the inside of the respirator as well. Um, the person has to be fit um, to be able to wear the respirator. There needs to be a fit testing program in place. And the person needs to be clean shaven. Um, if they're not clean shaven, they wear a beard or stubble, then there's the, the, uh, the air is going to take the path of least resistance and go through leaks around the outside of the respirator. The storage, uh, maintenance and use is very important. And um, training, the program evaluation, record keeping, availability, um, and that's, that's Margaret's um, presentation. I now have 20 minutes left um, for questions. So I have quite a few questions in the chat box here. On through this process, Nicholas, um, one of the questions there is about approval. Um, you might be closer to the approval process than me. Did you wanna um, share your thoughts about approval? Approval, so they were originally approved on May 10th in the PPE guidelines. And 
I, uh, I just posted the PPE guidelines from September 22nd from Ontario Health in the chat for anybody looking to look at the direct approval. Um, but it was actually, it didn't pass approval the first time around. So when the government actually started looking into them, they didn't actually use experts that had ever heard about their use in medical settings before. So when the government originally looked into it, they said that uh, there was no evidence that they could be safely used in a healthcare setting that they would be dangerous for patients to use. And some of the politicians that have worked with me, they also said that during interviews with the news organizations in Health Canada, in Ontario Health, in some of their websites online, they actually left that misinformation online that any respirator with a valve uh, would be automatically too dangerous to use under any circumstance. So now they are recommended as a safe alternative to N95s. They, the government has 100,000 available in their stockpile. So if you're a healthcare worker in Ontario, ask your employer to reach out to Ontario Health and to ask for one. Now, Ontario Health says they're only supposed to be used when there's an N95 shortage. You know what? We're in a pandemic. There is a severe N95 shortage. Jamie West, one of the MPPs from Sudbury, was actually talking about that in Parliament just, uh, I believe it was last week. He said that some long-term care homes haven't even had a single N95 since June. So we're in December. So think we've already gone through quite a bit of the second uh, wave. There's been quite a few infections and some of the homes don't even have the minimum amount of PPE available. And each elastomeric respirator can be used for years. So if there's 100,000 of them, that's 100,000 healthcare workers in Ontario alone. And then that would free up nationally, even if the other provinces refuse to use elastomeric respirators for whatever reason, there would be a significant more amount of N95s for the other provinces. Since they're not being used at all, it's just wasted and it's just wasted taxpayer money. So people are continuing to have to find alternatives such as reusing the same N95 for days at a time. And that has been shown to be very dangerous. So they've actually been approved uh, in the States before in Canada. On April 20th, the CDC came out with their recommendations and OSHA, I believe, came out with their recommendations to use them. It was April 3rd. So they've actually been approved and they've been used for over 20 years. So they've been safely used. And there's a recent study out of Finland, which showed that out of healthcare workers that use N95s or higher in Finland, especially in ICU settings, none of the nurses and healthcare workers got infected at work. While in the non-ICU settings where surgical masks were used, 63% of people became infected. And sometimes it's not even a surgical mask. Sometimes they'll just give them a cloth mask. That's why it's important to take the airborne precautions because using them can clearly save a life, but using not using them will not only possibly infect one person, but the spread will be going on to long-term care residents as well. So it's a continuation of the cycle. So by properly using them, not just in healthcare setting, but in any setting where outbreaks occur, you're breaking that cycle. And then if there's less spread of the virus, we're not gonna need to shut down the economy like we are doing now to deal with the spread of the virus because it could be better controlled. It's also a solution, not just for now, but since it can be reused, get rid of pandemics. Pandemics would be a thing of 2020. Whenever this pandemic is over, people could store their elastomeric respirators like some hospitals did after H1N1 and then take them out for future pandemics so the pandemic could be stopped right in its tracks. I have one here. Um, I just had to fill in the blanks a little bit, so hopefully I get the question right. Um, but it reads, what are the recommendations for elastomeric respirators if the work is outside in the winter? Um, so typically, if you're outside, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of dilution anyway, and there's still going to be natural sunlight. So the risk is going to be a lot lower. Um, nevertheless, if you're, if you're working um, within close proximity to somebody um, for 15 minutes or more, you know, we should be thinking about a respiratory protective equipment program. But the risk is much greater indoors. And if anybody else has anything to add to that. This is great that Ontario Health has made the recommendation because when I was uh, working as a health and safety specialist with ONA, we hadn't gotten that in there. But the problem is the directive, from what I understand, Directive 5 has to be changed because the only way, other than for an aerosol generating medical procedure, that workers are going to get any respirators are if they use it through what they call a point of care risk assessment, which I don't with. I think that the employers in the province should be getting uh, or providing respirators themselves under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. The problem is that the Ministry of Labour is not enforcing the Occupational Health and Safety Act 
and is being sidelined like they were during SARS to only make uh, any orders based on the directives. Now, I've been gone since the end of August, um, enjoying retirement, by the way, but still uh, watching out for everybody. But um, I have not seen that the directive has changed. And Nicholas, you're such an advocate. If you can somehow, it seems like you've got an end to people, get the directive changed and everyone in the province will start ordering these elastomeric respirators. Right now, they're only going to do bare bone minimums because of the cost. That's what's happening. For you to say something, Nicholas, thanks. Um, there you go. So I'll definitely try and get them to put it in more into widespread use. As for money, money is actually being wasted. So the Canadian government just released some of their figures and it's often provincial governments that end up buying the PPE supplies. But just in surgical masks alone, the government ended up spending $240 million to date. And those don't even meet the minimum requirements for airborne precautions. And to protect every single healthcare worker in Canada, if there was zero, zero last American respirators out there, it would be about eight to $15 million. So for about five to 10% of what they're spending on surgical masks at a federal level, every single healthcare worker in the country could have their own. So as for Ontario, there's already 100,000 available in the stockpile. So there's no reason they cannot be given for general uses, even if it's not an aerosol generating procedure. I, they should be used at every single time and any employee who feels that they want to be safer than what they have available, they should be able to switch to the elastomeric respirator or N95. And if, if, I, if I can just interject, um, you know, this whole uh, paradigm of aerosolized generating medical procedures is wrong. Um, if we saw the video from Australia, the person talks about um, aerosol generating um, behaviors. So, you know, we can actually um, put out the coronavirus just from talking, singing, coughing. So, you know, with regards to the directions from um, the provincial government, you know, the, 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 the risk needs to be recognised. The airborne transmission needs to be recognised and everything should flow on from there. Um, I don't know if you can have anything to add to that, Alec. I know Alec's had a lot to do with that. Um, um, the issue here that Ernest raising is a lot of times with health and safety, and she's really right to do this, there's a, a right that somebody has for an opportunity to gain a higher level of protection. But the route by which they can gain that higher level of protection is often a barrier. So what Ern is drawing attention to is the fact that currently the route is a point of care risk assessment that a, a healthcare worker would carry out. And I'll, it sort of puts each of them sort of on their own to do it. You have to have the courage or confidence to do it, the knowledge to do it, the support of the employer, the support of the union, whatever it might be. And highly likely there'll be some people who will lack one of those reasons and therefore they won't assert their right. Whereas a more proactive approach, uh, as exists in other countries, we're not talking about pie in the sky here. We're talking about other countries that have done this and proven how well it works, well documented. A more proactive approach would be to set that high precautionary principle standard. In this case, and remember, respirator, whether last America in 95, is just part of the hierarchy of of uh, prevention and protection, but it's pretty important. Uh, so ideally, it would be something that Ministry of Labor would adopt, adopt the precautionary principle. I draw to everyone's attention that um, the Occupational Health and Safety Act gives it precedence over the emergency legislation. In other words, if the Ministry of Labor wished to differ with the Public Health of Ontario directive, there's no problem, they could do it. There's nothing legal whatsoever to prevent them. And therefore, I think it should be proactive. I think we should bite the bullet and uh, implement the precautionary principle that includes uh, elastomeric and or N95 respirators and not, not sort of put it on to the individual healthcare worker with all the barriers that might exist. To add a little bit to what Alex is saying too. So if you think about precautionary principle uh, that is airborne, it's almost like having a fire extinguisher that is ABC. So if you get a fire extinguisher that is ABC, you could protect for any type of, or for three different types of fires in your home. But if you only get a type A for a fire because you don't, you assume that you're not gonna get an electrical fire or a grease fire or things like that, 
if you do have if a fire, you your house could burn down. But if you have an ABC fire extinguisher, you can quickly put out the fire so it doesn't do harm. Since we're refusing to do precautionary principle, we're watching all our healthcare institutions and healthcare workers become infected. So it's like our hospitals and long-term care homes are burning down. And instead of going to a better fire extinguisher to put out the fire, we're saying everything is normal. Don't worry about it. The fire will burn itself out on its own. That's why it's important to take precautions. It's it's important to be proactive because the virus spreads so fast and it could spread so easily and people are asymptomatic. So we have to take the precautions now. If we wait, then we see our, the, if we wait too late, then the virus is going to be out of control and it's going to be harder to stop it in the future. So countries that took more steps early on, you see they have much higher success rate than other countries that only waited to take the steps. Nicholas, um, I might throw it back to you again, Jennifer, um, just to mix it up a bit. Did you want to pick another question from the chat box? Al Wolf asks, is a surgical mask PPE or source control? Okay, um, so a surgical mask is primarily source control, um, but it does offer a little bit of personal protection. Um, so, you know, the kind of rule of thumb that I've heard, although it'll change depending on the wearer and the fit and all the rest of it, um, what I've read is that, you know, it does act as a bit of a barrier, you know, to stop the larger droplets, um, but, you know, the, the smaller particles, the airborne particles will go through the, you know, go through, or more, more of it will go through, and also obviously around the outside of the, the face because it's not a, a, a tight fit and it's not... Fit testing, fit tested. I've heard also that it, as for filtration efficiency, it can be anywhere from about thirty percent to fifty percent. So it's primarily source control, but it does offer a little bit of protection. Um, but it's not. I wouldn't really call it personal protective equipment um, as as such because it's actually designed, you know, in a sterile environment um, so that the patient doesn't get um, affected. The thing with surgical masks compared to an N95 or an elastomeric respirator it, is the filters in these respirators, they have an electrostatic charge built into it, which attracts the particles as well. So that is why they are much more successful at stopping the virus than a surgical mask or a cloth mask, uh, because they're able to attract the virus itself. It's not just trapping the virus, it's attracting the virus to be trapped in the particles, in the uh, mask filter fibers. N95s and elastomeric respirators can both protect against droplet protection as well. So for those people saying we don't need an elastomeric respirator because only droplet protections are needed, an elastomeric respirator, the material they're made from, they can better protect against droplet transmission than a surgical mask as well. So water and even other liquids you might see in a non-healthcare setting. So if you're working in a factory, it would protect you be much better than a surgical mask. And if I can just add to this too, you know, there's been a lot of research done to look at different kinds of fabric and different uh, filtering um, efficiency efficiencies for the different fabrics. What a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, face fit is equally, if not more important. So, you know, the, the protection factor is a combination of both filtration efficiency and face fit. So, it's important that we understand the, 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 these concepts, um, and especially if you think about going out into the general public, you know, if you're just wearing this kind of uh, cloth mask that sits over your face and it's kind of loose around the outsides of the face, obviously it's not going to protect you anywhere near as much as something that's not tight fitting and possibly even has a good face fit. Um, so the presentation um, through Workplace Health Without Borders on the 16th of December um, by Dr. Susan Arnold is actually talking about a, a face covering that sort of performs closely to a, to a respirator. Um, and also Raina McIntyre will really be able to talk about, um, you know, more talk about respirators versus surgical masks. Okay, um, so how are we going for time? We've got about six minutes. Uh, okay, Daniel Copeland has has their hand raised. Um. The question, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, respirators and uh, elastomeric respirators in the healthcare setting. I'm wondering if anyone can talk about uh, outside of the healthcare setting. I'll give our specific example. I'm a, a college professor. I teach in an aviation program. So we're in a very small confined airspace. We're literally sitting shoulder to shoulder, uh, talking loudly over engine noise for 
hours on end. Um, and we are looking very heavily at respirators. We've looked at a bunch of elastomerics, both in the passive half face, full face, and even some paprinos. So wondering what research or what uh, guidance you can provide in terms of work outside of the healthcare setting. Well, there's, there's really no difference, is there? I mean, um, you know, hazard's a hazard, an exposure's an exposure, a risk is a risk. So, you know, when you look at the, um, the Canadian standard and you look at the appendix, there's actually a, a section in there in selecting respirators for, for non-healthcare workers, which is probably a good place to start. Um, and it also really does come down to comfort. Um, you know, and it also comes down to breathing resistance. So you really want to think about maybe trialing some different kinds of respirators and then think about comfort. Uh, make sure that there's an administrator, like make sure that you nominate someone to go through um, the program requirements. But I suggest that you look at the comfort um, first and worker acceptability is a huge area. If the workers don't really feel comfortable wearing them, then there might not be good success in, in, in implementing the program. You also yeah. mentioned, Daniel, that uh, the environment that you'd be working in is very loud already. So what I would recommend is when you do look at elastomeric respirators, you look at some that have communication features or a speech diaphragm so it's easier to communicate in because you're already most likely going to be yelling. And if the sound is muffled, it's going to be a little bit harder in that kind of environment. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Um, that's very useful. Yeah, we have looked at a couple with uh, speech diaphragms. Um, and communication is a huge element. We have to be able to talk and communicate over the radio. So uh, definitely something to look and look look to and, and consider. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, does anybody else want to show their face and ask a question? Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. So um, Kevin, there's a good one about um, changing the cartridges, cartridge change schedules. You know, I don't really have an answer to that off the top of my head. Um, the Canadian standard will actually address it. I know the older standard um, <laughs> used to, with the, the vapor cartridge, it used to rely on smell, but they've changed that. Uh, but with uh, coronavirus, I'm not ex exactly sure of what the, uh, the change out schedule would be. But it's a very important point. It's very important to have a, a change out schedule. Is anybody else on the call or on the webinar can comment on that? So I can comment a little bit. So if you're going to be in a healthcare setting, it's going to be a little bit different than if you're going to be in a non-healthcare setting, because since the healthcare setting doesn't have as much dust and things like that, the filters are not going to be uh, as easily clogged. So the CDC and other agencies, they've been changing the recommendations, but some of the recommendations are once a year, unless they get soiled or they get too damaged to use. But you should also speak with the manufacturer because each filter could be potentially different so some filters might need to be changed once a month or it could be changed every three months. So depending on where you live, there's gonna be different recommendations in the US and Canada has slightly different recommendations, but generally in a, in a cleaner environment, about a year is uh, what some of the experts have said. Thanks, um, thanks uh, Nicholas. I just, there's a comment also from Erna as well. Um, she's got St. Mary's Hospital, thanks to an award achieved by ONA bought elastomeric respirators for all nurses. It is important to at least ask for a respirator as par part of your point of care risk assessment as it's not to be denied and if it is, call the MOL. So I just, um, we've got one minute left. I just want the, the take home message, message here is that on the 20th of January um, in China, they introduced airborne precautions and you just saw how quickly the curve flattened off. Um, and also, the reason that we're doing these webinars is to try and provide information for every person in this call to be empowered and to reach out and to do what you can to protect yourselves and those workers that you have influence over. So, you know, don't wait um, for the guidance to come to you in a hurry. It may take some time. It will come. We know it will come. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada have now acknowledged finally airborne transmission but there's still going to be a lag time. So if everybody can just take the message away and, you know, that they, they we need to think about better ventilation and we also need to think about hierarchy control and proper personal protective equipment. Um, and that's it. That's, uh, that's, that's the webinar. I just want to um, thank you, um, Nicholas um, and Alex.
and also reach out to Mario and say thank you for sharing your information.